you know, as we've been discussing, many people with cervical instability might have a separate diagnosis other than that, like post-concussion syndrome, you know, whiplash disorder. And another one we see is also um, Chiari syndrome or Chiari malformation. So you had an interesting case this week actually about that, if you don't mind sharing. Danielle, like a lot of people just are getting a whole bunch of MRIs and they're getting all kinds of diagnoses from these MRIs. But people always got to remember, you can't make a diagnosis just from an MRI or an x-ray study. It always has to be correlated with the history. Okay. And some of the saddest cases that you see or I see, it's people who've had so many surgeries. And if you go back in their history, all they really needed was a few prolotherapies. So I'll just tell you one history. So I recently saw a gal about 30 years old. Her problem started 10 years ago where she had terrible migraine headaches. She had referral like into her eye, into her face. She had balance problems, vertigo, dizziness, ringing in the ears, racing heart, kind of like some dysesthesias or painful sensations down her leg. And she got an MRI and it showed a Chiari malformation or Chiari syndrome. So basically all that is is the lower part of the brain, the cerebellum, sometimes parts of the cerebellum go into the hole that, that through which the spinal cord goes, which is called the foramen magnum. Mm -hmm. So it takes up space. So obviously if there's a part of the brain that's in this space, you know, you think like, oh, it's smashing on nerves and it's causing all kinds of symptoms. So sure. she ended up having that space, her foramen magnum uh, widened. So she had that surgery in 2004 then that didn't relieve any symptoms, so then they thought it was coming from her neck. Then she had a C3 to C6 laminectomies. That didn't really do anything. Then she had a fusion from C0 to C7. Wow. Then that didn't do so much. Then uh, she had the fusion, then all the way down to T2. So you can understand like the myriad of problems, and I didn't even talk to you about like the various spinal cord stimulators that she had put in. Wow. Then she had an intrathecal pump where they pumped in morphine into her spinal cord. Now it's like 2015 and then she's going to seek out a prolotherapist. But it didn't take me but a few minutes when I was talking to her and her parents that if you actually talk to her, it's like, how were you as a kid? When you were like in your teens, did you manipulate your neck? And she said all the time. Then she said she also has clicking in other joints. Like, and then it, when you examined her, she had hypermobility and an extensive amount of hypermobility all over her body. So she's a loose jointed gal. And if a doctor in 2004 would have just said, hey, do you, does your neck crack all the time? And da, da, da. So before the surgeries, there was evidence that she had cervical instability. So unfortunately, she didn't see us. So she had, you know, all these uh, different surgeries and then she's now th around the age of 30 and she's completely disabled wow. where when she was about 20 if she would have just had some prolotherapy because prolotherapy stabilizes joints that's basically what prolotherapy does most chronic pain as you know it's because the joints are too loose like much like a kitchen cabinet when the doors are hitting you don't shave the door you don't replace the door like you know it's the hinge the hinge is loose so you get out a screwdriver because people often ask me like you know, does prolotherapy cure pain? Like when you screw that screw in, that screw is going to be tight for the rest of the time of the, of the kitchen. Or if it's the kind of door where you open it a lot, mm -hmm. you know, you may have to get the screwdriver out 10 years later. So that's kind of how prolotherapy is because once these ligaments are tight, they're tight. So, you know, barring any new injury, you know, really the person's good. But just kind of sad that... Yeah. Uh, folks get MRI diagnosis like Chiari and they don't seek out a second opinion from a prolotherapist. So I, really anybody with Arnold Chiari syndrome or they got an abnormality like that, almost always you get symptoms because of upper cervical instability. Like there's lots and lots of people that have the diagnosis of Chiari by MRI and it's not from the, the, the symptoms aren't from that, or they don't have any neck symptoms, like they're just getting a brain MRI because you know they have some other uh, symptom related to the brain, like they might have a nummy feeling over here. And then the MRI shows the Chiari, and it's not causing any neck pain or anything. So just be wary, anyone out there who... Well, I think that's a good point, is that it might come up on an MRI, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's what is causing all your symptoms. It could be that 
you know, you've had that forever, but your neck pain, you know, only started after your car accident, you know, so. That, that means a car accident causes right, like a ligament right. injury and Should not be. a disc problem. Right. Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly right.